15 years ago, I met Eric Westman and he trained me. So he's one of my mentors and I appreciate all that he does and I always learn something from him. So I'm grateful for him and, and for the other speakers that are here. I, I always learn something from everyone. I talk really fast. <laughs> so I'm gonna try to slow down, um, but I get so excited about this that, uh, that, that hopefully you'll, you'll, you'll pick it up. Um, anyway, you got to see this already. Is, is it really a problem? And I wanted to just give some, some numbers that you may have seen this. This is something that gets repeated a lot. But in the year 2000, 19% of us were obese. And in 2017, 39.8% of us are obese. That's a big deal. The challenge is that every year, the average American gains between 1% and 3% of his or her body weight. And that's a huge problem. Um, that's what, what drives this. I'm a, I'm a visual person, so you can see that... Um, in 1985, they didn't have any data here, but as time's gone on, you can see that now we're at 35 to 39% obesity in the, in the south, southeast part of the country. And that's just huge. Um, you know, in nine months in solitary confinement, and this is what I have to, live, to, look, to put up with. So, you know, when babies are being born, this is what they look forward to if we're not careful. So we need to change this, and hopefully you'll see this change over time. Um, so what are the costs? And I always put this up because I, I'm also a health policy fellow, so I look at you know, what are, what are the policies that we're making legislatively and are they benefiting us or helping us? And the challenge is that um, we've had to make larger stadium seating. We've had to increase the braking systems on all of our, our uh, public transportation. We've had to make the airline seats bigger. We've had to reduce the um, entrance exams or entrance physical qualifications for military. And we've, uh, we have now the big John toilet seat. <laughs> And as you're going to see in a minute, that we now have the double wide casket, which, which, I, which directly affected my family and, and may, may still affect it if we're not careful. Um, the other issue is that food stamps follow the USDA guidelines. And if our guidelines are telling us to cut out fat and eat more starch and sugar because we're hungry, guess what happens? We, the average person on food stamps gains 5.8 pounds per year more than those that are not using food stamps. That's, that's terrible. That's sad. Um, but that's what we end up seeing. And so that's a big deal, and that's a big problem. Um, the reason I wrote a book, The, the Keto Cure, was that uh, af after I started using ketogenic diets in my practice and with myself, I started noticing that there were 16 to 20 different disease processes that started getting better naturally with just dietary change. And all of these diseases are driven by being overweight and insulin resistance. All, they, all have two, they all have two, two, two similarities. They're all related to weight, weight gain, and they're all related to something called insulin resistance. So we're going to talk a little bit about that if we have a moment. Um, anyway, Houston, we have a problem because this is a major pro issue. And it doesn't just happen to humans. I, I live out in Waddell on the far west side of the valley. And when California falls off in the ocean, we'll have beachfront property out there. Um, <laughs> but this is where, this is me, and this is my horse, Bailey. Um, this is three of the six horses that are on my, on my little farm or ranch, I guess you'd call it. My wife's horse is named Jazz. Interestingly enough, when Jazz eats a diet higher in carbohydrate and different grasses have different carbohydrate levels, alfalfa has more carbohydrate, 20% more than regular Bermuda grass does, she starts to get laminitis, which is classic for insulin resistant in horses. In humans, we get skin tags. And that's what you end up starting to see. And so if you have skin tags anywhere on your body, those little polyps of skin around your neck or your arm or your groin, guess what? you got insulin resistance, and I'm talking to you. All right. Um, what drove this? Well, my father um, weighed about 400 pounds when he died at age 58. He had type 2 diabetes, which progressed to insulin dependence. He was on um, 150 units of insulin a day and 32 pills a day when he died. And this is him just a couple months before he passed away. Um, he had he went into kidney, he, full spectrum or complete renal failure, lost the ability to walk because he had charcoal joints in his feet, which is the collapse of the heels. He was in a, he was in a wheelchair and um, ended up dying at 58. My, the concern is that his labs and my labs looked identical in our early 30s. Couldn't tell us apart. I had a triglyceride of almost 500. He did too. Um, I, I was 65 pounds heavier than I, when, when I, than I am today when I came out of medical school. All of the Nally men, or most of us, look like my father. We have this tremendous insulin resistance and obesity. Um, and it, it permeates my family and my family history. And so my concern was what I'm doing in my practice with my patients isn't working for them or for me, so we got to do something different. And so that's what drives this. So um, you've heard a lot about calories, and there's still argument about this, but I'm going to tell you what, what, what we talk about. Calories in my office is a swear word because they're little tiny creatures that live in your closet and sew your clothes a little tighter every night. <laughs> That's my definition of a calorie. Um, 
And then we're gonna to touch brief, briefly on what's called the obesity paradox. Um, when, when the challenge is that you have these two conflicting views, science and principle, and they conflict. And when you apply what the science it says versus what, we, what, what the application is, it dramatically conflict, and we create policy based on that, and it becomes a major issue. And I won't dive into that heavily, but what I want you to see is this. If you look at the three largest studies ever done in regards to calorie restriction, and what the outcomes were, you're gonna see something very interesting. And this blew me away when I first saw this. Number one, we had a study in 1991, the Women's International Health Initiative, or the Women's Health Initiative, one of the largest studies ever done, um, fi almost 50,000 women. They, they were a low fat group and a control group were, were kept. And over that period of eight years, they lost a whopping less than, this actually should be 0.88. It's almost a pound. They lost almost a pound with calorie restriction over eight years. That was really successful, wasn't it? <laughs> then there was the multiple risk factor study, the Mr. Fit study, and they cut their calories out for seven years, and this is almost 13,000 men, all placed on low-fat, calorie-restricted diets, and they didn't lose any weight, nor did it stop heart disease. Hmm. Kind of interesting. Then there's the, the look-ahead study, and this was 5,000 diabetic men who were supposed to have had, you know, been successful with this. It was supposed to go 13 years, but it failed, so they stopped it at 9.6 years. They did very, very intense calorie restriction and guidance, and, and were very, and rather than just asking them what they did, they actually helped them with their meal planning. They did lose some body weight, but they didn't live any longer, and they didn't stop any heart disease. So wait a second, the three largest studies that we've ever done with calorie restriction we're not successful in weight loss, preventing diabetes, helping us live longer, or stopping heart, heart attacks. That's 60, 67,000 people. You'd think we'd get a clue, but we don't. Unfortunately, men are often too weak to follow their best judgment. So <laughs> that's why we're here and we're doing these conferences. So whenever I say this, people go, well, Dr. Nelly, you know, there's that first law of thermodynamics that says a calorie is a calorie and it can't be changed. And we're here at ASU, which is one of these premier engineering schools, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about this for a moment. The first law of, it, the first law of thermodynamics says if I put a calorie in, it's got to come out the same way and we can measure it. But the challenge is this. There are actually four laws of thermodynamics, not just one. Uh, law number one, law number two, and law number three. And the calorie in, calorie out dogma violates Number two, the issue is this. It talks about entropy. Now, entropy is the randomness or disorder, and it says that it's always increasing. So if I take an ice cube and I put it in, at room temperature, it will disorder itself until, it's, until the water re reaches that temperature, and the ice will melt. So that, that works in the first law and the second law work in a closed system. So if you have this system where there's cold water here and hot water here, and you open up the valve, it will equilibrate. But the important thing to understand is that um, random disorder occurs over time except in the mammalian body. And the reason is there are 38 hormones or 38 different valves that make that impossible for it from happening. So if we measure the calorie in, in between the two valves that are open, yes, a calorie is a calorie. But there are 38 different hormones that drive that process. And that's the problem. It doesn't take into account the fact that hormones, ketones themselves acting like hormones in many cases, actually change that paradigm. Um, and balance cannot be expected because of that reason. So if you hear that dogma, recognize that yes, a calorie is a calorie, and we're not changing the, the law of thermodynamics, but we have to make sure that all 38 hormones are balanced in that regard. So in my perspective, the weight that we lose or gain is driven by hormones, not by calories from that perspective. So in my practice, what I started seeing was that 85% of the people that walked into my office had what's called insulin resistance, myself included. And what that means is if you give me a piece of bread, I should theoretically produce a slice worth of insulin to absorb the sugar or the glucose in that piece of bread. But if you actually give me that piece of bread, I will produce 10 times the insulin in response to that, that piece of bread. My body will think I ate the whole frickin' loaf, and it will store fat as if I did for the next 12 hours. That's the Nally genetics. Welcome to my world. Now, we do know that we are a little more sedentary, and we do know that there are metabolic deficiencies that cause a challenge with obesity, and those are two separate issues, but what I want to talk about today mainly is what's the, what is insulin resistance and how does this relate to obesity and hormone regulation? So we have this really cool hormone. Now, I do not want to demonize insulin because we need it, but we don't need 10 to 20 or 30 times the normal amount. 
And that's what happens because when you have too much insulin, all of these really cool diseases of civilization start to arise. You see increased inflammation, which has been talked about. You see increased weight gain. You see decreased nitric oxide, which actually drops, which actually raises blood pressure. You see an increase in sodium retention, a an increase in blood pressure. These, are kid these cause kidney stones. This is cause what causes heart disease, this and this. You have free radicals. Those are not the um, terrorist type. Those are the kind that cause cancer. You s actually stimulate an increase in autoimmunity. You actually turn men into women and women into men. And that becomes a problem socially. <laughs> So what I started noticing over time was that, hey, um, and, and I actually, after I had kept, had seen this pattern for about 10 years, I ran across a book by Joseph Kraft, and he was a, a researcher that actually showed, in, so what I've done is I've taken his data and what I see is that, is that in the first stage, when you fast, your insulin should be less than five. And when you eat a meal two hours later, your insulin will be somewhere around 40 or, and sh or should drop below 40 at, at about the two hour mark. The challenge is that as if you hit stage two insulin, you start to see insulin somewhere between six and 30, which is what happens to me when I'm fasting. And, and then after a meal, it goes up. In stage three, you see this pattern. Interestingly enough, that's a diabetic. If your insulin's over 31 when you fast, you've got a type two diabetic. You've got type two diabetes in my perspective. And then with my father, when his pancreas burns out, or type 1 di diabetics who don't make any insulin, you may not see any insulin at all. These are people that actually now need insulin over here. But that's the, ch that's the, the, the staging of insulin resistance in my perspective. And that's what I see every single day in my clinic. Now we treat, between me and my two PAs, we have about 8,500 active patients. And we've been doing this for 15 years in my, in my clinic. And this is what I see every single day with 85% of the people that walk through my doors. So why is this all important? And I don't want to overwhelm you with physiology and science, but it's important that you understand because these answer a lot of questions that I get asked every day. When, when, how do we get increase to go down then? If I'm insulin resistant, what do I go to do to make it go down? There's no pill, I'm sorry. You just gotta stop eating carbohydrates, all of them. And in, when, your insulin, when your glucose drops below 80, guess what happens? Insulin falls to normal. But if, and then what happens is if, if you have extra insulin, you're making too much of it, then it drops below 70, your glucagon and your epinephrine kick in, and that's when you get a little hypoglycemic, or, or as my wife says, I get hangry. Um, this happens because glucagon and epinephrine kick out, and then when it drops below 67, you see growth hormone and norepinephrine, and then you see cortisol rise after age 65, or after below 65. At less than 55, you start to get lightheaded, dizzy, and sweaty and less than 50, um, your brain slows down and it slows you down socially. Um, you, it can, you, know, you can have challenges. Now, what happens over time though is if you're producing too much insulin, initially this feels really bad, but as your insulin level levels off to a baseline, you start feeling great and you can actually handle these areas. But what I wanted you to see was, it's not a calorie that causes these changes. What we're gonna show you is that th these hormones right here actually drive weight loss. So if we can bring the sugar down to where it ought to be, weight loss kicks in naturally right here because of the release of those hormones. So um, truth, number, truth number two, um, that was truth number one, insulin resistance. Truth number two, if I take away your carbohydrates, if I blockade them off, don't give you any carbohydrates, um, proteins are, can be used if they're needed, but they also are used for, for muscle and, and connective tissue just uh, formation. But if I just give you fat, that triglyceride is processed in the liver and turns into ketones. There's three of them. There's beta-hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate, and acetone. Those act as fuel instead of the glucose. And your liver loves to make ketones. It does it really, really efficiently and really, really well. You just have to lower the insulin load so that the carbohydrates are not stimulating insulin and this process turns on. Now, everyone says, well, what's the balance between the, the sugar and the insulin? You know, it's, this, it's the pancreas. Um, actually, no, it's the liver. Um, your liver's primary job is not to filter things. Your liver's primary job is to keep the brain happy and to keep the blood sugar somewhere between 70 and about 95. And so it will continue to do that by producing glucose to make the brain happy because the brain needs that, that, that small amount of glucose to make neurohormones and to, to make you have serotonin and dopamine. Um, and if, you know, if those are down, you get depressed and anxious and schizophrenic. So it's important to have those. But you have these cool fat cells. Now, your fat cells are actually the largest endocrine gland in the body, and they make hundreds of hormones, eight of which, and five of them I have here, directly influence the liver. 
Adiponectin and leptin diminish the, pr the, pr the presence of glucose production. So when your leptin goes up, all of a sudden you get less hungry. When your uh, adiponectin goes up, you get less hungry. When re resistin goes up, you actually, the liver starts making more glucose. And when tumor necrosis factor alpha and interleukin-6 actually are produced, they blockade the signal of insulin. And so when you get a fat cell that gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it's, it starts overproducing these hormones abnormally. You'll, you'll find it interesting that tumor necrosis factor alpha and interleukin-6 are key hormones in all cancers. And what happens is our fat cells get bigger, they get sicker. We, it's, called what's adip, it's called adiposopathy, sick fat cells. And those sick fat cells overproduce these hormones, causing the liver not to do its job, and the pancreas has to kick out more and more and more insulin to keep up. That's insulin resistance. It's sick fat cells, poorly influencing the liver, and the pancreas is trying to keep up. And there's no pill that fixes this. The only thing that fixes it is carbohydrate restriction, period. That's all I've found in the last 20 years. There's an interesting thing that happens, though. What happens if I take those away and I give you ketones? What happens if I do nothing but just give you ketones? Ketones suppress every one of those five hormones. This is why I've had patients use ketones um, even when they're not fully ketogenic and actually see success. And so the ketone itself has a hormonal effect on these five hormones and suppresses it and helps to reset that balance. It takes, in my practice, about 18 to 24 months of carbohydrate restriction to see this reverse, and it actually does reverse. In my clinic, we have over 100 patients that are no longer type 2 diabetic. In medical school, we, I was told that was impossible. I've proved them wrong 100 times over the last 15 years, just by carbohydrate restriction, period. No fancy pills. Now, I may give you fancy pills to speed the process along or to help other things, but the coolest thing in my office is stopping medicines. Um, you know, that's, that's the cool thing I like to do. All right. Um, the psychic fair was canceled due to unforeseen circumstances. <laughs> <clears throat> Truth number three, this process will take you six to eight weeks. Don't be surprised. So remember, most people go through what's called the keto flu, and it's usually because they're salt deprived, especially here in Arizona. You need salt. You need about two to three grams per day. If you are out on the ranch like I am outside, then you may need up to five grams per day. I take in five grams of, of pink salt every day. Otherwise, I get lightheaded and dizzy, and my wife said, are you hungry or are you just salt deprived? So that's what happens. All right, truth number four. Uh, one does not just simply enter ketosis. Um, <laughs> ketones only form when insulin stays around the baseline level. Now, what does that mean? That means less than 20 grams of carbohydrate per day for most of my patients. Um, and now I have patients that come to me and say, well, Dr. Nelly, I don't really want to lose any weight. I just want to lower my cholesterol and get my blood pressure to improve. Amazingly, I find that 10 to 20 grams per meal allows for a person to do that. They won't lose weight usually, but that usually helps correct the other diseases that are there. Now, most of the time they come back to me a month or two later saying, Dr. Neely, it doesn't work. Your diet sucks. And so I say, well, as Dr. Westman talked about, what sweeteners are you using? Because most of the sweeteners out there spike insulin, and I've re repeatedly seen this on labs over and over again. Leaf-based teas do it. There's a tannin in the teas that do it. Green tea, black tea, oolong tea all contain a tannin that spikes insulin all by itself. In fact, we, we, we considered using green tea to treat diabetes back in the 50s uh, as insulin was starting to be developed because it actually does lower the blood sugar, but it's because you're releasing more insulin. I had a guy that lost 20 pounds but could not get the weight to move, and, and I went through his diet. He was eating perfectly, and then finally after asking him over and over and over again, I said, what are you drinking? He says, well, I do nine glasses of black tea a day. He cut out the black tea and he lost another 35 pounds within a two-month period. Um, that's, what, that's what the tea does. Coffee creamers are basically sugar that was made to taste like fat. If you want to put something in your coffee, put the fat back in. Um, excessive protein. Now, for those of you that are horribly insulin resistant like I am, am or was, um, too much protein halted my weight loss. Now, as you get leaner and leaner, you're going to hear other ketogenic experts say, well, more protein's better. Well, as you're leaner and leaner and the fat cells aren't sick, yes. There's a whole, there's a whole different paradigm we start to use for building muscle and that, but we've got to get the insulin resistance to go away first. And frequently, with many of my patients, modulating the protein initially is, is very important as well. So that's what we do in my office. Um, you need to be closely monitored by your doctor. And I, I say this because I had a lady call me up. She was so excited initially because she lost weight and it was the first time she had been able to successfully lose the weight. And then a few months later, she called me up and just chewed me out and said, Dr. Nally, you almost killed my husband. And I said, well, who's your husband? Well, he's not your patient. But <laughs> he, I put him on your diet. 
and his blood pressure dropped and he passed out and the ER doctor said he, was gonna, he, he almost killed him. And he's on four blood pressure medicines. I'm going to tell you that when you follow this diet, you're suddenly going to see your blood sugar normalize, your blood pressure normalize, your cholesterol normalize. And if you're not being followed by a doctor and you're on four blood pressure medicines, I guarantee you're going to pass out. Because very quickly, your blood pressure and blood sugar will normalize. And it's important your doctors, you're working closely with your doctor to make sure that's okay. Now, what's the definition of high fat? In the literature, the definition of high fat is any diet that contains more than 30% fat. That's high fat. Oftentimes with a ketogenic diet, we'll take this up to 70, sometimes 80% fat. But anything between 30 and 80% is a high fat diet. And so a lot of people get confused by that definition thinking that high fat is only 70% fat. It's not. You may find that you can do, with, with a lot of my bodybuilders and athletes, they do a little bit lower fat, a little bit more protein, and they still see ketosis and good success, and, they get, and their goals of muscle building improves once their insulin resistance is reversed. Key there. And again, we're talking about moderating protein. I won't go into that heavily, but... All right, what raises insulin? Now, again, I'm not wanting to demonize insulin, but if you're insulin resistant and you're producing too much insulin, these are all the things that make it worse. And so one of the things that I have to do every day, every day in my office is I want you to bring in your food journal to me and I'm going to ask you, are you taking any of these things? Because if, this, if you are, your weight loss is probably being inhibited by one of these fancy little things. I went to a an unnamed, very large ketogenic conference a few months ago. There were 500 vendors of great tasting keto products. Of the 500 vendors, only three of the products in all of those vendors could I eat because they all contain something like this. And for me, who's horribly insulin resistant, I have to be very careful. So real food is where I tell people start. That's probably all you need. So be, be wary of that. Truth number five. Um, I won't go into this heavily because of time, but weight loss requires a functional thyroid. So if you're doing this all and you've, you've eliminated all the sweeteners and you're, you're following a real food keto diet, you've cut your carbs down, you may need to have your thyroid checked. And then secondarily, you may need to have your female hormones or your male hormones checked because these will also play a role in regards to weight gain. And I'll show you why in just a minute. This is one of my patients and she's aware that I used her slide. She told me I could. She actually told me, please do it. Um, this is five years post gastric bypass regained 105 pounds. Um, this is nine months into a ketogenic diet. She's literally down 75 pounds. Diabetes is gone, insulin resistance is gone, she's off all of her blood pressure medicines, and she's feeling phenomenal. That's just nine months. Real food keto, that's really what it is. Um, successful keto ketosis does not always affect the scale, but it always makes your pants fall down. <laughs> because you'll gain muscle and lose fat. And I have patients that come into my office that are not exercising, and, they're, they're, and it's usually women, and they're really mad at me because they haven't lost any weight, the scale hasn't moved, but they're down two sizes on their pants. And because they're gaining muscle and losing fat at the same time, and that's what's happening. So don't be, take your scale and give it to the neighbor you don't like. <laughs> Go back. All right, fat cell. This is very busy, and I don't want to bother, overwhelm you, but number one, lower the insulin. If you don't turn off the insulin, it shuts down this whole process and, and you can't let fat out of the fat cell. Number two, thyroid hormones have to be balanced. If they're not balanced, it can't let fat out of the fat cell. Number three, catecholamines, epinephrine, norepinephrine. This happens when your blood sugar drops to lower than 80. And it happens throughout the day as you're physically active and things like that. All of a sudden you let fat out of the fat cell. Number four, testosterone's functional. Number five, short chain fatty acids and the production of ketone actually drives the process of the release of leptin and opening up the pathway to let fat out more effectively. Those are the five back doors of the fat cell. If you can actuate all five of those, you're losing weight really effectively. And the amazing thing is that a ketogenic diet does this very simply and very easily. Um, low magnesium uh, is also an issue I see uh, that can affect it. So remember, magnesium is a salt. Sodium, potassium, magnesium, and zinc. If you're not replacing those with a ketogenic diet, you're going to see some, some slowing of the weight loss and changes in your thyroid function. Um, we've talked about poop and guts today. It's great. This really, truly is an important thing. You've got to have good gut health to absorb those things. Um, if you've had a heart attack, don't check your thyroid for two months afterwards because it will abnormally be off. And um, if you're doing all these things and you're still having fatigue, you may, there may be something called mitochondrial dysfunction. I may, I'll touch on that briefly. Or you may need to have your thyroid looked at a little closer. I won't go into that specifically. But 
insulin resistance, dr uh, selenium deficiency, high stress, poor sleep, all of these things slow the thyroid down, and again, being one of the back doors of that fat cell letting fat out. So important. Um, if you have chronic migraines, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, or chronic pain associated with your weight gain, often I see that these people have mitochondrial dysfunction. And what I've found is that replacing these six um, supplements is actually very effective in essentially helping the mitochondria, which is the, essentially the carburetor for the cell, handle the fuel processing better. And so, so something you may consider in, in that regard in help, helping your mitochondria. All right, choose number six. Um, exercise without the correct diet is like trying to empty your pool with a teaspoon. And I've got people that are trying really hard. I mean, they're scooping, they're scooping. Um, so so the, the reason that exercise doesn't work is if you don't turn off the insulin, number one, again, if we go back to this, if you don't turn off the insulin flow, the, all that running around and exercise will do you absolutely, absolutely nothing because it shuts this process off. The cyclic, cyclic AMP turns off. That's why when I exercised my brains out, I just felt tired and exhausted and hungry because my insulin was always high and I could never get that to be under control. All right, tooth number seven. Um, hunger is suppressed by increasing the fat intake. Medium chain, long chain fats, short chain fats, these are all fats that suppress your appetite. You gotta have cholesterol. You gotta have it. And amazingly, when your cholesterol goes up, your LDLC goes up. That's normal. I see it every day. I put people on a ketogenic diet and their LDLC goes up and their HDL goes up and their total cholesterol probably goes up, but their particle size and their triglycerides drop. And we, know, and we now know in the last three years from multiple studies, um, those are the particles that are problematic in regards to causing and leading to heart disease. Um, so don't worry about your total cholesterol or your LDLC as long as your triglycerides are under 100. And if you do a particle number or those kind of things, those are other ways we could look. But I'm not worried about cholesterol because you have to have it for testosterone, progesterone, estrogen, and the conversion of vitamin D in your skin. Just because you take vitamin D doesn't mean you're converting it if you don't have cholesterol. The, the vegans and vegetarians have a major problem with this. And the reason is that animal-based cholesterol is absorbed really well in the gut. Plant-based sterols are not absorbed. Only 5% of them are absorbed. So if your diet is completely plant-based, you're not getting the cholesterol you need to make myelin around your brain, to make these sex hormones, and to make vitamin D. Don't base your decisions on the advice of, of those who don't have to deal with the results. If you're, if, you're a, if you're an avid blog reader, and I know many of you are, because you've told me you are in my office, um, if the person giving you the advice can't fix the advice when, when it's broken, don't ask them for the advice. All right, just a reminder, cholesterol turns into pregnenolone, which turns into progesterone and, cortic and cortisol. It turns into DHEA, testosterone, and estrogen. You gotta have cholesterol. If you don't got cholesterol, you don't got sex hormones. That's bad English, but that's how it works. Again, Testosterone is a key in, in opening up that fat cell. You have to have adequate testosterone. All right, what foods can you use to stabilize your diet? This is what you can use, bacon, eggs, hard cheeses. Now, yeah, Velveeta is not real cheese. It's like cheese food or something like that. Now, one avocado is a fruit, and there are 20 grams of, up to 20 grams of fructose in that avocado. It's a fruit. It's a fruit, it's a sugar. If you eat the whole bowl of guacamole, you will not be in ketosis. <laughs> so be wary of that. Secondarily, avocado oil is really high in omega-6 fatty acids, and that's highly inflammatory for my patients with arthritis. So don't cook in avocado oil. Use real bacon fat or butter. So some other things to consider. Truth number eight, are you married to the stress? I bet he's thinking about other girls. <laughs> if I smuggle guns into Hong Kong, can I get cheaper bacon? <laughs> Are you under stress? Stress playing a role. Stress stimulates the autonomic nervous system. And amazingly, your thoughts turn into hormones through this really cool system. That's why when the bear rears up in front of you in the front of the woods, your heart starts beating really fast so you can either fight the bear or run from the bear. But if you don't run from the bear in the next 30 minutes, guess what happens? You release these really cool hormones, cortisol, insulin, adrenaline, epinephrine, and glucose, that are essentially a donut. <laughs> you, you, gotta, you gotta find a way to lower the stress, whatever it is to lower that stress. I am a delicate femi feminine flower. <laughs> Shut up about my total cholesterol. 
and give me back my coconut oil. <laughs> are you stressing out about your coconut oil? Are you stressing out about your food? Find a way not to stress out about it. I have patients that are so worried that it's not grass-fed. I'm just going to die. No, you're fine. In fact, I tell them, I want you to go to Costco and buy a hot dog without a bun and eat it right now. <laughs> Seriously. All right. Remove the anger. Remove the regret. Remove the guilt, the blame, the worry, the garbage. Add bacon daily and then watch as the light fills your life, health fills your navel, and, your ha and happiness fills your soul. One little caveat, um, I find that 60% of the patients in my office have an MTHFR deficiency. This is a, a poor ability to methylate folic acid. You may want to check with your doctor to see if you have this. It's a genetic issue, and just adding a simple methylated folic acid solves the problem. It's usually the cause of neuropathy in all of my diabetics, and when you, re when you supplement it back appropriately, about 50 to 60% of them have a complete resolution of their neuropathy in their feet. Depression, anxiety, and schizophrenia are also driven by a lack of this. However, you want to make sure you're balancing it correctly because too much folic acid can actually cause the opposite effect. So you want to make sure you work with your doctor on this. But I just want to make sure this, this plays a role in a lot of my patients who are having trouble losing weight as well. They're deficient in this, and when we fix this, it actually helps a lot. Um, it, if you're lacking energy, mood, vascular function, growth, this plays a big role. So this may be an issue that I see. And if you're pre-diabetic, I see this a lot of, with a lot of people. I won't go into it real heavily, but that's a, a big factor. Lastly, number 10, sleep. It's that time of apoptosis, testosterone rejuvenation, and muscle recovery, and it's just like being dead without the commitment. <laughs> you gotta sleep. Sleep is important. Uh, it really is. It, it plays a role without stress, it allows you to recover, it does all those important things. All right, so how do you get started? What do you do for a ketogenic lifestyle? Lower the carbs, get adequate protein, substitute out foods. I find that people go, I don't know what I, what do I eat. Well, I, I ask them, what do you normally do in the evening? Well, I eat chips. Well, okay, let's eat some pork rinds instead, but do it before six o'clock. And so let's do some of these things that may be playing a role that are important. Um, these are some substitutions. Uh, have you tried the fat bar, the at -at bars? I'm just gonna plug that, because they're really good. Um, these are, some, find a good cookbook, find a journal, find a partner. You need someone that helps and, and partners with you. Um, bacon is just really the duct tape of the culinary world. I'm just putting that out there. And that's the end.